pray to the Lord. Pray to him while he can be found, for he is near us whenever we pray. His eyes open, his ears attentive, listening to what is said in hearts and whispers. When tears fall down cheeks, in silence, when no words can be said but thank you, according to his compassion, according to his kindness and his great love, he is our dwelling place. So cry aloud, call on him, bowed on bended knees, confess sins, offer petitions, watch and pray. Find your own mountainside, your own garden of Gethsemane. Pray in lonely places when things are good and not so good. Pray for those who are unable to pray for themselves. Stand guard, mind your post, stand on the wall in the gap as words lifted to God build bridges to nations. Prayers are seeds planted. Even if you never get to see them grow, God is the gardener, paying close attention to the soil of prayers lifted for generations yet to be born. In the place of prayer is where peace can be found. And we may not know how or why, but we know who. And when you are spent of words to pray, he prays for you, taking all the things you can't give voice to, surrendering them at the feet of one who is all powerful, whose words extend past time, whose love is so wide and deep that it is immeasurable. Pray and don't give up. Pray earnestly. Raise your voice and quiet your soul that God may dwell in your heart. Pray when you're anxious. Pray when you're afraid. Be watchful and thankful. Pray continually. Pray to the Father, to a God who is faithful, to a God who hears. Cry out for the living God. that again this morning we're going to be singing some songs together but I just want to pray first off so join with me in prayer oh Lord Jesus it's great to be in your presence Lord we acknowledge you as the Lord and Savior of our lives we acknowledge you as the creator of this universe Lord we just thank you for being here your word says um, where two or three are gathered you are there we accept that promise and we claim that promise but more than that Lord we want you to be here. We ask you, we, we invite you to be here. We invite you to be here in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our voices, that all that we do and say and sing would be a, a blessing to you, that it would speak to our hearts. Lord, you are a holy God. Lord, we want to praise you. We want to lift you up. We want to exalt your name forever. Amen. I invite you to join us as we sing. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
I need to put my glasses on so I can read. Then I have to get my phone out. This morning, I read these words. It was actually posted uh, on Facebook by a friend of mine, James. And it was uh, ooh, just uh, from Psalm 63. And it says, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. We're going to lift him up because we are here, I hope, to worship. So I invite you to worship this morning. Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Sunday, there is a psalm to be read. And last Sunday's psalm caught my attention. It's Psalm 109. My God, whom I praise, do not remain silent, 
For people who are wicked and deceitful have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues, with words of hatred. They surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship, they accuse me, but I'm a man of prayer. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. Appoint someone evil to oppose my enemy. Let my, an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty. And may his pray, prayers condemn him. Wow. This guy's not in a good place. And it goes on. That was up to verse 7. And if I keep going, scrolling down, just keep scrolling down. We're up to verse 22. Yep, verse 23, you keep going. 26. Help me, Lord my God. Save me according to your unfailing love. Let them know that it is your hand that you, Lord, have done it. And verse 30. My, with my mouth I will greatly extol the Lord. In the great throng of worshippers, I will praise him. For he stands at the right hand of the needy to save their lives from those who would condemn them. I thought, what an what a amazing psalm that is. It is so raw. And he's spilling that out to God. And that's what we need to do. We need to come to him just as we are. Whether we're in a happy place, a good place, or whether we're having a tough time. We need to come to him just as we are. We're going to sing a new old song or an old new song, Just As I Am. But it's one of these songs where they've added a little extra bit. And I love this little extra bit where it says, I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. So we're going to sing these, this song. Just as I am, you recognize the verses, but the chorus office will be new, but it's a very simple chorus part. So let's join in just as we worship and bring ourselves to Jesus. Just as I am, I will. 
to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. I come broken to be mended. I come To be rescued, I come empty to be feared, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I. Just as I am. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that we can come to you just as we are. That whatever situation we find ourselves in, how we are feeling spiritually, emotionally, mentally, Lord, we can come to you and just leave it at your feet. Leave it at the foot of the cross and you will take care of it. Lord, I just thank you that we are able to meet here in this way, in this place, so that we can worship you. And Lord, I just pray now as we continue on in this service, Lord, that you'll be here amongst us, that your Holy Spirit would be moving amongst us, so that we'd get a real sense of your presence, and that you would speak to our hearts today. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. course there is much to pray for in our country still at this time isn't it with the battle that we are facing against this pandemic so as we just quiet in our hearts to start this time of prayer I've asked Kelly to come and share a prayer for our country a prayer for Australia in a time of pandemic Great God and Heavenly Father, please come powerfully to our nation in these dark and difficult days. Please slow the spread of this virus throughout our land and indeed across the world. Please protect the vulnerable from its deadly touch. We ask for you to lay your healing hands upon those now infected. Please restore them to health and strength. Please comfort the families of those who have died from this disease. Please fill their hearts with your presence and gather around them friends, family and neighbours, however it works in these days of social distancing, who will comfort and support in their time of loss. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of modern medicine and thank you for the passion and dedication of medical staff everywhere. Please give each and every one of them your wisdom in every decision they make. Please protect and sustain them and give them strength energy and courage they need to carry on. Please guide the minds of our leaders in the decisions they make that will affect all our lives. Please lead them to act wisely, carefully and in the best interests of all Australians. Please shine your light on the path ahead. Please draw close to the anxious hearts and troubled minds of those who now face great financial stress. Please protect them and their families from long-term economic damage and guide them day by day and step by step through the crisis. Please give each one of us the calmness and wisdom we need to carry us together through the days, weeks and months ahead. Please, loving Heavenly Father, draw especially close to those who are alone or troubled at this difficult time. We, of course, think think particularly of our fellow Victorians. Some of us have family there and probably all of us would have friends and those we hold dear. Calm their troubled hearts and move their friends, family and acquaintances to call them, to encourage and support them. 
Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you understand our suffering, for you too have suffered. You have seen your beloved Son suffer rejection, humiliation and death on the cross to rescue us from the powers of darkness. Please bring great good out of this time. Please remind each of us that we do not need to make the journey of life on our own, in our own strength, but that you are here, as close to us as our own breath, to fill our hearts with your love, surround us with your powerful protective arms, and guide us in your path. We ask all these things for this country and these people we love in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. During this week, Kelly um, messaged Catherine, who of course, along with Phil, are over in Wyndham, um, which is one of the worst hit areas of Melbourne. And Kelly asked, is there anything we can do for you? And they simply said, can you pray? So I'd like to do that just now as well. I said, there's so many people struggling. We need to be upholding all these people in prayer. So Heavenly Father, we do pray for the city of Melbourne and the state of Victoria. And for all those words that Kelly's just shared with us, we just ask out of our humble petition of our heart that you may be at work that you will indeed be protecting those working on the front line in particular there's a, there's a nursing home in the Windham area we know so many nursing homes have been hit and the one in the Windham area is not immune to that so really protect the staff there first of all as they work on that front line keep them impervious to this virus so that they can continue to serve and look after the residents there that they need to. For the mental battle that this is causing so many people, Lord, the isolation, the social isolation and displacement that it causes, we know there's so many ways we can connect today, Lord, but still that loss of physical connection can really get to people. So we pray. We pray that your people, the people of your Salvation Army Corps, the people of your churches across Melbourne may be mindful in keeping connections with people. They may be mindful in following up with people, seeing how they're going. So we can fight, fight against the mental struggle that people are facing. And Lord, we pray for Phil and Catherine as they work at the Wyndham City Corps there. And just know that the, the struggle it may be, must be for them at this time to be displaced and from their people and for their gatherings to be impacted as they are right across the state. So really support and strengthen them, Lord. You know we hold them dearly uh, from this congregation here. So may your spirit be their strength. May you innovate and guide for all the ways they need just to be able to support people. And indeed we know that in times of great distress, people can indeed turn to you and see who you are. So may they be effective in showing the way to your great salvation. We think of Gemma as well, Shelley's daughter, and know that her work and her ministry has been so impacted as well at this present point in time. So her sustaining grace for her as well, we pray, and that you may just lead her on, encourage her and strengthen her, and still find ways for her to be your person, your minister, to all that she has contact with. So much we have asked for, Lord, and much I know that hasn't been voiced audibly. But you are a great and mighty God. And we know that you can overcome it all. There's a corporate prayer that's going to be on the screen, on the PowerPoint. We're just going to share to close this time. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, you are the hope and healer of people and have promised a world where there is no more sickness or crying or death. In these days, we look forward to that promised world and pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Through our lives, and by our prayers, your kingdom come. We ask that you would give wisdom to those who are seeking a vaccine for the coronavirus. We give you thanks for those who are treating the sick 
and ask that you would give them strength and compassion. We ask that you comfort those who are mourning the loss of loved ones or living in fear of this disease. We pray your special protection over those most vulnerable, the sick, the homeless and the elderly. Please give the government and health authorities wisdom in their management of the crisis. We ask that they would provide clear and timely guidance. Help us to trust in you and look to you. May we know your peace and be generous and wise in the way we seek to show the love of Jesus to those around us, in our families, in our streets and in our workplaces. Grant us tender hearts to serve and a renewed confidence in your steadfast love, compassion and mercy. Help us to be wise in the way we live. Turn the hearts of many now experiencing fear and anxiety, that they may find peace and comfort in your love. Open the hearts of all to the loving work of your Spirit. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Reading from God's Word, from Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8 and verses 4 to 25, Philip in Samaria. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time a man named Simon had practised sorcery in the city and amazed the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he'd amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptised, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness, and pray to the Lord in the hope that he might forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Amen. Well, welcome to everyone today. It's great to see you gathered again for worship today. And um, I trust that there's a joy in your heart that we're able to do that and have the freedom to do so. I don't know if your week's been busy. Our, our week has been, continues to grow with our community breakfasts. I thought I'd just share with you this morning. We had a little bit of a quiet day on Monday, but then on Wednesday we hit a new record. Um, I think Nigel and Jim told me they cooked up 82 muffins. So it was probably about, I don't 
don't know, 30, 35 people in maybe for breakfast. Some have more than one, but that's all right. We're happy to do that. So it uh, just seems to ebb and flow a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's a really, um, I suppose, great support we're providing to the people of Launceston at this time. So continue to pray that we may make good connections uh, with the people that are coming in. Uh, it's, you know, like, obviously we have to contact Trace, but, you know, as most people walk in now, you know, know their names, can write them down. So it's so starting to build those connections and, as I've said before, getting to know their stories. So, yeah, pray that we may have a greater impact than just the provision of material support there as we speak and journey with people over time. In a few moments' time, I'm going to give a chance and opportunity if you'd like to share a testimony. Uh, so I want to choose my words very carefully here. This isn't planned. I haven't asked anyone to give a testimony. So if you want to give a testimony, that is entirely your choice. And in doing that, I don't think there should be any age restrictions on that. So because it's your choice. If you want to share from your heart after we have the offering, um, I'd ask that you come to the mic, just so it goes over the live stream well. Um, and yeah, so we'll see. I think we can manage that okay. If I get into trouble later on, so be it. We'll see how we go. So yes, uh, Meredith is going to share our offering for us today. Uh, if you have a monetary donation to give today, I know many are giving electronically as well. Uh, there are the collection bowls here. And uh, so while Meredith plays, if you're able to make your way and give your offering to God this morning. Thank you. Dear God, the song says, All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. So we thank you, Lord, for all your love. Please bless our thank you gift of this money. May it be used to help us know more about you and your people who didn't know you find Jesus as a Saviour and Lord. Amen. So there is that opportunity uh, for a word of testimony if anyone would like to share this morning. I've got enough else planned if no one wants to, so that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared for that as well, but I just thought it's been a little while since we've been able to do that. So if anyone would like to, the mic is yours. Thanks, Lynn. I just want to praise God and thank him. 
uh, for bringing my granddaughter Holly home safely from Victoria. She's been living there for two years with her mother and I was, yeah, well, really worried about her. And so, yes, so now she's living in Hobart with her father again and she will be there permanently. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for God's provision. You've got to go to the Mookers here. People watching over the live stream, so we want them to be able to see and hear as well. Hello to everyone over the live stream. Well, I said something to Neville this morning, and it was a praise the Lord. And he said, well, maybe you should testify about that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but I will testify to the fact that God is great. He's been my saviour and my friend and my keeper, my helper for all these years. And... Uh, the years ahead, I know that he's going to be there with me. He's a great God. How can we not praise him when we look around and see the goodness? Even with this uh, time we are going through, there are so many people who are excelling themselves in, in helping and in, in encouraging people. So I'm encouraged by the fact that God is a great God and I can testify to that. And the other testimony, dear folks, you are never going to hear about. <laughs> That's what we're related. You'll get away with it. I praise the Lord for his encouragement. I've been feeling, um, I don't know, it's been a bit different working from home. It's been a bit different moving back into the office again and lots of people um, talking me, to me about the challenges that they have and all of those things. And I've, um, I've struggled a little bit at times um, with, with some of that. And um, am I being a good um, testimony for Christ has been um, my real challenge because um, I find that I'm drawn into the same um, uh, feelings of misery that some of those people that are sharing with me, they're almost bringing me down. And then um, I was um, on the internet this week and I've got a, um, a couple of pay, uh, groups that I uh, am in with um, people I was in the regular army with. And uh, someone made a comment on, on those pages during the week and they said, oh, Reevesy, we remember him. He was the guy that didn't have to shove Christ down our throat, but you can tell that he walked with him. It was a great encouragement to me, and I yeah. think that's the best that you could ask for anyone to say of you, isn't it? Yeah. That um, they see that you walk with Christ. And I pray that the Lord will continue to encourage me to walk with Christ in these days and to be joyful of the promise that he has given us. And as I said to a couple of people at a meeting at work this week, well, we've got a pandemic on the world. All that we need to do to plan for that pandemic is to make sure that we're right with Christ. Yeah. Final opportunity? We're going to sing again. I divide the team back up as we sing our lovely words above all. Thank you. I invite you to stand with us as we sing this. It is like a testimony in itself. We're acknowledging that above everything is Jesus.
for Roderick as he brings this message this morning that the words he speaks will be words from your mouth to direct into our hearts help us Lord to apply them to our lives I pray in the name of Jesus Amen Now, I have a little illustration to start with today. So, Maya and Lucy, would you be able to come and help me, please? And Cadence. And then I probably need a couple of other volunteers as well, but I've got to be careful who I ask, of course. Perhaps I should pit mother and daughter and sister against each other. I have some money for you. Okay, two more volunteers. One more volunteer. All right. It's not real. Oh. <laughs> it's not real. Okay. We're going to run an auction. Okay, so I'm going to get you to bid to buy the supernatural talents that I'm going to auction off. So you have $600 there. Not real, though. Okay, so not real, but... You can choose to spend the $600 all on the one talent, if you like. Whoever bids 600 first will win it. Or you can try and hedge your bets for two. I've got seven supernatural talents. So you can try and score a couple, if you like, or just blow your 600 on whichever one you like. You ready? The ability to fly. Who will give me $300? $300. <laughs> 300. Come on, someone give me 300 for the ability to fly. I fly 300, anyone any advance of 300? 400, do I hear 400? No, 300 is enough. Oh, okay, that's, that's a slow start. $300, June's bought the ability to fly. If you don't spend your money, you're just going to be stuck with it at the end, and it's not real. I've told you again, it's not real. How about the ability to have super strength, like Mr. Incredible? 
You know, from the Incredibles film. Super strength to lift anything. $200. Who give me $200? Super strength. If you had to shift all these chairs real easily when they need to be shifted. 200? Can't, someone's got to give me 200. Okay, it's $200 for super strength. No? They're not necessarily in any order. They don't necessarily get better. Oh, okay, yep, you see? June's buying it up. Okay. The ability to breathe underwater. Mermaid, merman. $200. See all the fishes swim with the dolphins. 200. 200. 300. 100, is that it? No one wants more than a... No one wants to be more than... Oh, she bid 100 first. No, no one's going to be more than 100. This is a pretty poor auction, guys. <laughs> The ability to travel through time. 600. So. Super fast speed, like Dash from The Incredibles now, and what every parent wishes their child had when they're trying to get them out the door. Super fast speed. $300 for super fast speed. You want to win cross country? All right, three hundred dollars. And if, do you want to bid more than three hundred dollars? Four hundred. You going you gonna to bid five hundred? You do if you give me another two. Don't want our builder. Oh, you have yours back. Okay, Lucy's got the super fast speed. Two to go to make yourself invisible. One hundred. Any advance on one hundred? Any advance in 100 to make yourself invisible? 300? Alright. 300? Any advance in 300? People will run into you, you alright? Kelly's invisible. Last one. I don't know who's got the most money. The ability to read people's minds. Who's got the most money left? 300? How much have you got left? You got 400? You got 500 still. Did you diddle me before? Didn't you pay 200 for something before? But you took them and you gave it back. Did I? Anyway, you paid $500 to read people's minds. Okay. All right, so we'll sew it up. Now, we're going to do the test. Okay, can you start flying, please, June? You, can you start flying? You bought the ability to fly. Can't you fly? Choose not to. I, I, I don't think, Kiki, do you really buy the ability to fly? How about, oh, we need a tank of water. Who bought the ability to breathe underwater? Maya. Maya. I'm going to go take you home, I'll put you in the bath, and we'll, so we'll see how long you can breathe underwater for. Does that sound like a plan? She can talk underwater. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Who's travelling through time? Cadence. Off you go. Where did you go to? No, you've got to go and then come back. I went to three seconds ago. Can you really travel through time? Is that something that could be bought? In a mind. Who's the super fast speed? Okay, uh, she's ran around the building so quick we didn't see it. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Alright, go off you go, see how quick you can go. Run around the building and back. No? But you've got super fast speed. I can see, still see. <laughs> and who has the ability to read minds? I'm thinking of a number between one and a hundred. What is it? Think of a number between one and hundred. What am I thinking of? No, it's not. Okay. So you couldn't really buy those superpowers. Thank you. Give me a round of applause. You can go back to your seats, thank you. If you want to keep your fake money, you can. Just don't get in trouble with it. <laughs> well, in our scripture story today, we read about someone who thought they could buy a superpower and how that didn't really work out so well for them. So, the reading from Acts chapter 8, it's a story that's really in two parts. We have the main part of the story, 
which is building through the whole book of Acts, revealing how the gospel message continues to spread, how the church is continuing to grow. And then there's this part we read about the interaction with a particular individual, Simon. I'm going to look at the main part of the story first. Now, Jews and Samaritans, they didn't really get along. We can probably almost be as bold to say that they despised each other. And this dissension had been simmering away for centuries by the time we get to Acts chapter 8. It started from the time the Assyrian Empire came in, conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And the practice of the Assyrians was that they'd then take the people that were there and move them to another part of the empire and bring in their own people. So then over the centuries, the Jews had intermarried with the Gentile people that came in. Uh, so they'd become of mixed heritage. So the Jews from the southern part of Israel now saw the Samaritans as half-breeds or unclean, no longer from a pure Israelite lineage. And there were also religious differences. The Samaritans, they built a rival temple to the one in Jerusalem, which the Jews then destroyed in 127 BC. They developed their own form of worship. They had their own modified form of the Old Testament covenant. So in a nutshell, the Jews thought they were better than the Samaritans. There was a fair depth of racial and religious animosity between the two groups. So when the church scatters, following the stoning of Stephen, Philip heads to Samaria. Okay, that's a bold move. No doubt he was led by the Spirit. And perhaps he was the right appointed messenger to go there because Philip himself was most likely also of a non-Israelite racial heritage. He was one of those seven Grecian Jews we picked that were selected in Acts chapter 6. Philip boldly proclaimed the message of Jesus Christ to the Samaritan people, before miracles of healing, of casting out demons, bringing a great joy to the city. I love that. It was a great joy across the city. Philip was preaching both what Jesus had done and what he had taught. Acts 8 verse 12 says he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And I think the use of both phrases here is important because Philip was giving the people a complete picture of the good news of the gospel. So he's preaching what Jesus Christ has done for us through his death and resurrection and preaching all that Jesus taught about the fullness of what that actually means. How things are to operate in the kingdom of God as opposed to the kingdoms of the world. And that's both in the here and now and the hope of the future fulfillment of the kingdom of God that is yet to be experienced. So Philip was fulfilling the great commission of a disciple maker. Now as we're alongside people over time, we're alongside the people that God has placed around us, our extended family, our oikos. We need to make sure we've equipped ourselves to be able to give a complete message of the gospel and that's in both word and action as Warren shared, action as well, before. You know, it's not just being able to tell others about what Jesus has done and what he can do for them, and we should all be able to do that from our own personal testimony and experience, but we've got to also be able to tell others what Jesus said and taught about the kingdom of God. The completeness of the gospel message that Philip was able to preach and that was visibly visibly confirmed through the miracles he performed, it resulted in many Samaritans believing And being baptised, you know, it was effective. Through the accounts we read of in Acts, we continue to see these foundational truths, these principles for how we effectively convey the gospel message. We've got to know it in its completeness. You know, we declare Jesus as king. If we do that, we also need to teach what he said his kingdom is like, you know, what it is all about. So when the apostles back in Jerusalem heard of Philip's effectiveness, I reckon Philip organised for news to be sent back. He wanted to share about the amazing things that were happening. They were probably pretty dubious, really. The Samaritans are believing and being baptised. Now I think we can suspect some scepticism because it is the main men from the 12 disciples themselves, Peter and John, that go to investigate. And we read in verses 14 to 17 this rather curious statement that when they arrived, they found that the people had been baptised but had not yet received the Holy Spirit. They'd simply been baptised in the name of Jesus. 
And I'm so curious because up until this point in Acts, being baptised in the name of Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit really wasn't something that happened at two separate moments in time. But Peter and John didn't fall into the trap of letting the circumstances of the cultural divide that they'd grown up with dictate what they did next. You know, some of the experiences we read about Jesus interacting with people from Samaria, I think, had no doubt prepared them to respond better. So they didn't revert to an attitude of, you know, we were right. We knew these reports wouldn't be what they were made out to be. Instead, their response was to pray for the people so that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And then then as they prayed and they laid hands upon them, the Holy Spirit was indeed released amongst the Samaritan believers. Now, there's nothing in this account to indicate that a two-stage conversion is the normal pattern for the church across all time. And what I sort of read as the background to this and what makes sense to me is that this was an historically exceptional situation that arose for the purpose of establishing unity. Establishing unity between Jewish and and Samaritan believers. You know, the Samaritans who were regarded in that derogatory, that half-breed sense, received the promised Holy Spirit at the hands of Jewish apostles, subsequent to Philip's, a Gentile Jew, evangelizing and placing their trust in Christ for salvation. A whole mix of racial heritage and nations there. In this instance, the fact that the final blessing of the Holy Spirit was received through the hands of Peter and John, it brought the Samaritan believers under the apostolic umbrella, if you like, of the Jewish disciples. So it had that effect of bringing great unity. It helped ensure the unity of the church was growing. The unity of the church was coming back together between these two racial groups who despised each other for centuries. And if it didn't happen this way, the Samaritans might have continue to remain a splinter group with hostility towards the Jewish people. You know, the gospel is a great equaliser. In the gospel, there are no half-breeds, there are no physical rejects. There is no Jew nor Greek, no slave or free man, no male or female, to quote Galatians 3.28. Just a fun fact on the side, one of Catherine Booth's favourite verses. There is no place for human prejudices in the gospel, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And the fact that in the gospel message there is acceptance, there is true acceptance for all, that is what brought great joy across the city. They were finally accepted, these people who had been despised and cast down for centuries. They were accepted. You know, coronavirus has dominated world news headlines this year. But of course, the other big story has been the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm not going to say too much about that today other than this. However noble, however well-intentioned, however truly passionate for change and justice people are, I fail to see how a movement based solely on human wisdom and understanding can ever get to the point where it doesn't continue to perpetuate a cultural divide on some level. For the answer that we need, it's above the level of human understanding and action. Now, from what we read here, it's the gospel. It's the name of Jesus Christ. It's the baptising power and presence of the Holy Spirit that is the answer. Cultural differences between Jews and Samaritans, centuries old, started to be dismantled within a relatively short period of time when the gospel message was proclaimed. Now the church is to be a church for all nations. I forgot to grab my prop. It's supposed to be standing behind me. See, my memory gets worse as I get old. The church is to be a church for all nations. As ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we are to carry this answer of how unity is truly reached to all people. The Salvation Army here in Australia perhaps doesn't all that well, hasn't done all that well in this regard. If you look at the stats... We're the second lowest performing domination in respect to the church that migrants will choose to become a part of or join. If we want that to change, and I think we should want that to change, we need to powerfully communicate the fullness of the gospel message and let the unity of God be at work. Now we'll shift gears. Now for the side story, the illustration we had earlier. And the illustration we had earlier has helped set the scene for this a little bit, I hope. 
And it's an interesting backdrop to the main events. Simon the sorcerer, the great power. Sounds like we could transport him here to the 21st century and he'd make a mint. Though Simon, of course, would have really loved that. Whether his power was just magic and illusion, whether it was one of a cultic origin, we're not exactly sure. Seems the people attributed it to a supernatural origin in some way. They called him Simon, the great power of God. Well, Simon, I think, was quite a bit egotistical. He was boasting he was something great to all the people. So when Philip enters the scene and becomes the centre of attention, he does amazing things. It appears that Simon actually jumps on board. We read in verse 13, Simon himself believed and was baptised and followed Philip everywhere. But the hints that this was most likely not a genuine conversion is given in that same verse. For we read, Simon was astonished by the signs and miracles he saw. And it lies in the word astonished, because the Greek here means displaced, thrown out of position, or we say thrown out of one's mind. You know, wondering, how can this be? How can this happen? I think if Simon had truly believed... While he may have been amazed at the supernatural power and miracles of God performed through Philip, he would have understood where the source of that power was coming from, from God himself. Rather, this charlatan who had made his living by throwing people out of their mind with wonder, you know, how can he do that? He was now on the end of his own medicine, so to speak, on the receiving end of his own medicine. And Simon's lack of true belief is seen once Peter and John into the scene. When Simon sees the Holy Spirit being received as the apostles lay their hands on people, he tries to buy this ability. He tries to buy a superpower that cannot be bought, for it can only be received. You know, if we say we believe, then we must also receive. Be open to receiving the radically transforming power and presence of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit in us need to commit to living a life directed by the fruit of the Spirit that his presence brings. We know them, don't we? Love, joy, peace, patience, I hear kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Simon gets a harsh rebuke from Peter in verses 20 to 23. May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Thought you could buy a gift that is freely given without any demand for repayment. You know, Simon's offer was a grievous insult to the grace and the holiness of God. Peter quickly discerns that Simon's issue is that there has been no true repentance. Even if Simon had genuinely believed what Philip had preached, that Jesus was the Son of God, sacrificed for us, he'd made no personal application of that message to himself. Seen no need to personally repent. And Peter concludes his rebuke to Simon with, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. You are full of bitterness. I pondered those few words this week. I sat with it. Wonder what did this mean? What's being driven at here? And I got back one word entitlement. You know, from the original text of verse 23, this statement of Peter to Simon is better translated as I see you are full of the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. You know, the gall of bitterness carries with it the connotation of a harsh heart, a resentful heart. And the bond of iniquity, well, iniquity obviously does mean sin, but the original word here means more literally the exact opposite of God's righteousness and justice. So you could say, Peter was saying to Simon, you are bound by the bond of unrighteousness, the bond of injustice. Is there anything in this world that creates more injustice than the sinful attitudes of human entitlement? Is there anything that breathes resentment in the heart more than being unable to attain what we believe we're humanly entitled to? Now, entitlement can mean the fact of having a right to something. It can also mean the amount of something to which a person has a right. Or 
And this is the gnarly one because it all comes down, it can come down to a distorted perspective resulting from our own sinful nature. Entitlement can mean the belief that one is inherently deserving of privileges or special treatment. Sinful attitudes of human entitlement can combine us by holding back repentance in our lives. And it'd be quite subtle at times in how entitlement makes us resistant to change. You know, we've always done it this way. This is the way I like things to be done. This is the way that things should be done and I'm entitled to my opinion. Have you ever used those words? I think I might have used the words I'm entitled to my opinion at some point in my life. Simon didn't want things to change from himself being seen by all the people as the great power. So that sense of entitlement led him to believe that what the apostles were doing could simply be bought with money. We've spoken often in recent months about how the approaches of the church in the Western world need to change if we are to see growth, if we are to see freedom in helping bring a renewed spiritual harvest. We can't let perceptions of entitlement hold back that change that is needed. For a sense of entitlement also holds back the freedom of the Holy Spirit of God to complete a powerful work of transformation in our lives. Simon thought that the Holy Spirit was something he could manipulate, something he could have power over. Rather than a transforming power, he'd be unable to resist if he truly believed. When we say we believe in Jesus Christ, we, we of course know we're talking about more than just a basic intellectual belief that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Believing faith speaks to a personal persuasion, a conviction and trust that we know the person and work of Jesus Christ to be true, to know that what Jesus has done, he has done for me. But maybe there's an element of faith, of belief that we do always wrestle with a little bit. For when you dig down into the meaning of the word believe, the etymology of the word as they call it, I like teaching myself big words sometimes, the etymology of the word. There's a very simple phrase that I now run with for describing genuine believing faith. And it's this. If we believe in Jesus Christ, then we have given ourselves up to Jesus Christ. Surrender. Full surrender. You know, over recent months, we've received a call to live lives of repentance. We've heard the prophetic call to be the people of God as we are always intended to be, kingdom builders. Maybe the further piece we've added today to this journey of discovery is that a sense of entitlement can severely hold us back from living a life of repentance and being all that God intends us to be. The belief that we are inherently deserving of privileges or special treatment in the ways that we've spoken about will hold us back from being fully surrendered, from believing in Jesus to the depth that we are called to. You know, we actually are an entitled people. But the claim to all entitlement that we have comes not from us, but only through what Jesus Christ has done for us. The only right we have for the Father to address us as his children, as co-heirs with Jesus and the inheritance of the kingdom of God, is because of the opportunity of restoring salvation that Jesus Christ has secured for us when we believe in him, when we give ourselves up to him. So today, I simply ask for you to let the Holy Spirit of God search your heart once again, every part, to see if there is any corner where a sense of entitlement is present, any sense of entitlement that might have been tucked away, because if there is, it will hold you back from God having all there is to have of you. And that searching can be painful. It can be hard. But as we both believe and receive, the powerful transforming presence of God will make a way. Let him do something new in your life today to draw you in closer to being all that he intends you and all that he intends us to be. Rick is 
sort of reference the song we're going to sing together. God will make a way. Earlier this week, I put a post on Facebook about an annoyance. And a number of people, including my mum, said, it's okay, God's got under control. I was thinking, oh yeah, this song's for me, God will make a way, it's okay. Then, what through Roderick was saying, the uh, Jewish people and the Sumerians coming together, God will make a way. The prayer, the corporate prayer we played for the coronavirus in Australia, God will make a way. So I invite you to join with us as we sing, God will make a way, but there seems to be no other way. message of hope and joy, committed to sharing that message of the name of Jesus Christ and the fullness of the kingdom of God. For it's the answer, we're convinced that it is the answer that people need to hear, that people need to understand and know for their life to be so much better, for their life to be one that is flourishing in the grace of and the love of God. So Lord, may we be a people who just seek to follow you completely. Understand whatever change needs to be made. Understand whatever openness we need in our lives towards all people. 
so that the church may just be a unified body of Christ for all nations across this world. May we just have open arms to everyone here in our city, Lord. Open arms of the gospel message. May we never hold any of it for ourselves, for it is not ours to hold, but as we receive, it is ours to share. So in boldness, give us the passion and the discernment, the insight that we need to be committed disciple makers in the kingdom of God. May growth for the kingdom come and may it start here with us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. A benediction. May the path that you walk be ever guided by justice and light. By the truth that you stand, may it show into the land. May the words of Christ disturb you all your life. The road you have chosen is not easy. Yet here you stand. Amen. May God bless you each as you love and serve him across this community this week. Thank you.